You got it? All right. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, Lord, I thank you for these students who just pray with us today. Help us to uh, just uh, answer any questions which remain about the concepts on this homework we're working on. And just again, Lord, I thank you for your many blessings to us this day. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So, guys, questions? Yes? Uh huh. On like problem 29B. On problem 29B, you say. The answer for 29 part B, I do believe you can do the integral. I think. Um, yeah, yeah, I can do that integral. That integral can be done. Um, if you let u equal t squared, then you'll have like sinh u du. So you can do that integral. Do you want to do both that? Yeah, your answer should be a vector of functions. Would you guys let me do, uh, let, me, let me do a related but similar problem to that one. If I had that the velocity at time t was equal to 1, um, you know, e to, the, e to the t squared times t, and then, I don't know, cosine, cosine of 2t, suppose that was the velocity at time t, and I'm also given that the um, position at time 0 was equal to 1, 2, 3. Then I could say, find the... Um, the acceleration and the position at time t. So this is like 29b. <clears throat> okay, so how do you find the acceleration? That, that, that's the easy part, right? It's that dv dt. So let's see here, I get 0, I get um, e to the t squared plus 2t cubed, e to the t squared by the product rule and the chain rule, and then minus uh, 2 sine 2t. Two Indeed, bless you. So there would be the acceleration, just differentiate each component, right? Um, and then, so d, v, v of t, right, is equal to dr dt. So there's two different ways to go here. I'm going to take the uh, integrate add a constant and then fit the constant route. So if I integrate indefinitely, this gives me r of t is equal to what? Well, the integral of dt, because it's just 1 times dt. The integral of t e to the t squared dt. And then the integral of cosine of 2t dt. But these integrals are all relatively elementary. I can make them. This is like t, if you let u equals to t squared here, you can see that the integral of this is in fact just 1 half e to the t squared. And then the integral of cosine 2t, well, that's, that's 1 half sine 2t. Now, you can believe me or not, but the proof is in the differentiation. If you differentiate the vector I just wrote down, you can easily see that you get back to my v. Again, the way I knew to do the middle term was u substitution which we do still expect you know. And then, of course, plus a constant. Now, what is that constant? It's a vector in and of itself, but how do I figure it out, right? The position is not some arbitrary function. It is a specific function of time, because it's because I gave you an initial condition. So there's just one solution. There's not a whole family of solutions. How do you find the one solution you're looking for? The, the thing I haven't used yet is what? Right, I have, I have not used yet that r of 0 is 1, 2, 3. So we use that to fix the value of the constant. R of 0 is, on the one hand, 0, 1 half. And then this is 0 again, right? Because sine of 0 is 0. But that's plus a constant, right? So you can see, then, that the constant is what? The constant vector is what? It's just 0 minus 1 half, 0. And with that, I can write the answer, the answer being r of t, the position of the particle at time t is just t comma 1 half e to the t squared minus 1 half comma 1 half sine of, oh, 
I'm sorry, I'm an idiot. Oh man. Yeah, I know what you guys are about to ask me. Uh, I just set it equal to zero because I'm an idiot. What was R of zero equal to? <laughs> it was one, two, three. Okay, yeah. So with that, what does that mean C is equal to? <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's what? It's C is equal to, yeah, so th this vector minus that vector, right? So you say one, I heard one, three halves, and what? Three? Okay, and, and, and with that, now I can write the answer. So it's one, one plus t, um, one half, one half, one half, so listen to me, one half e to the t squared plus three halves, and then three plus one half sine two t. That's the position at time t for the given problem. Yeah? Ah, yes, but as I was saying, it's the product rule and the chain rule combined. So, so that is dt dt e to the t squared, right? Plus t ddt of e to the t squared. So that's why I had e to the t squared plus t times 2t squared. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. T. Oh, yes, 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 you're right. Thank you. Huh. How did I get that? Huh. Yes. Indeed. Ah. This should be in red. <laughs> Do you get bonus points for that? If you had not asked, yes. The first rule of bonus points is do not ask for bonus points. <laughs> the second rule of bonus points is ask for bonus points before your friend wants to get bonus points to remind me I should give bonus points. <laughs> so the likelihood someone else gets bonus points today is greatly increased by your request. So you can take personal satisfaction in the goodwill gesture that you've done for the class. It's good. But generally speaking, I'm very happy with such comments, so thank you. See, I'm on the cusp of giving bonus points for that. I don't know. I, I, let's, let's keep talking. Oh, next question, before I waste too much time on this silliness. Oh, how, do, how does integral of hyperbolic cosine and sine go? Yeah. So uh, the long story short of it is the derivative with respect to x of cosh of x is equal to the cinch of x. And the derivative with respect to x of the hyperbolic, oop, listen to me, cinch of x is equal to cosh of x. So yeah, the integrals, likewise, integral of cosh is cinch, integral of cinch is cosh. There are some wrinkles. There, there are some signs that are missing or, you know, um, I don't know, like what's the derivative of inverse hyperbolic tangent? What's the hyperbolic tangent of x is what? Cinch over cosh, right? So if we talk, talk about the derivative of hyperbolic tangent by the quotient rule, that's what? Cinch squared x minus cosh squared x, because I drew, do derivative of the top. Um, yeah, top times derivative of the bottom minus the derivative of the top times bottom. Is that right? Or do I have this backwards? No, that's right. I, I just, I'm sorry, I'm having a moment's crisis. I can't remember the quotient rule, which is sad, but I blame business calculus. OK, that's not really a fair, a fair complaint. I was teaching it to them yesterday. So there's the quotient rule. And that's what I used. And then, of course, downstairs, you got cosh squared x. Now, remember, we talked about the other day, cosh squared minus cinch squared is equal to? One. So this is 1 over cosh squared x, which, by the way, is, guess what? Hyperbolic secant squared of x. Where's the negative one? 
Oh, yeah, thank you. I'm glad you guys are on top of things. So yeah, like I said, there's some unanticipated minus signs here and there. But this is, a, I mean, this is nice to know about, right? For example, if you talk, what's the derivative of inverse hyperbolic tangent of x? How do you figure out the derivative of that? While we're, at, while we're on this, let's do this. So to calculate that derivative, since you guys, some of you don't know, what you do is you say y equals inverse hyperbolic tangent of x, right? If I want to find the derivative of some inverse function that I don't yet know, but I know the derivative of hyperbolic tangent because we just figured it out. So I just set y equal to that, take the tangent of both sides. This gives me the tangent of y is equal to x, right? Now I differentiate that implicitly. That gives me, apparently, minus hyperbolic secant squared of y times dy dx. Derivative of x with respect to x is what? It's 1. So there you go, dy dx is 1, or, or minus 1 over hyperbolic secant squared of y. Now, can you rewrite hyperbolic secant squared of y in terms of cinch and cosh? I mean, what is that? Let's see here, cosh squared y minus cinch squared y is equal to 1. So how do I, how do I get a hyperbolic secant squared from this? I, I divide by cosh squared, right? So divide by cosh squared, I get 1 minus hyperbolic tangent squared is equal to hyperbolic secant squared. So you see this secant squared y can be replaced with what? <coughs> minus 1 over 1 plus, uh, minus 1 over 1, minus 1 over 1 minus the hyperbolic tangent squared of y. In other words, that's minus 1 over 1 minus x squared. Or you could write that as 1 over x squared minus 1. Who cares? Well, I mean, anybody who wants to do this integral should care. The integral of dx over x squared minus 1 equals to? Right. Inverse hyperbolic tangent of x plus a constant. There you go. This integral just became elementary with that knowledge. How would you have to do that integral otherwise? Well, from alpha, no. You guys are better than that. Partial, partial fractions, right. This is 1 half, 1 over x minus 1 plus 1 over x plus 1, I think. Let me check it. Yes. And so another way, this is also equal to 1 half, you know, the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 1 plus the natural log of the absolute value of x plus 1 plus possibly another constant. So apparently, the inverse hyperbolic tangent is related to the sums of natural logs of x plus or minus 1. In fact, there are formulas that relate the inverse hyperbolic functions to natural logs in a very specific way. It's in your book somewhere. This should have happened somewhere in calculus, too. It probably did, depending on where you went. Anyway, I think, I, I think that's a good dose of hyperbolics for now. That, that satisfy your hunger for hyperbolic, blah, blah, blah. We could go on. There's anything you can do for trig substitution, <laughs> there is a mirrored hyperbolic substitution that you can do. And some things are easier with hyperbolic, some things are easier with trig. They're kind of two sides of the same coin. Yes, sir. I would like a printout of what you did, yes. So you could take a screenshot if you want and print it or something. Just something. Otherwise, I'll just have one person do it, and then everybody else say, I did it. <laughs> Anybody done part D for themselves yet? I showed you guys how to do it with Sage that one day. Yeah. I did Sage. Oh, you did it with Sage? <laughs> yeah. It's pretty neat, isn't it? You can play with the numbers and make the donut get smaller and bigger and stuff. It's really cool. Yeah. I did not come up with this equation on my own, by the way. Like this, this equation here, it's not something I just dreamed up of 24 plus x squared plus y squared plus z squared quantity squared equals 100 x squared plus y squared, you know? I wasn't just sitting down and I'm like, hmm, I guess I'll plot that and see what happens. 
that's not how this homework happened. I was reading a book, and it's like, the equation for a torus in Cartesians is this. I'm like, whoa, I've never seen that in a Calc 3 book. That's in my homework next semester. <laughs> so it's from Wolfgang Kuhnel's uh, Elementary Differential Geometry book, which is a, it's a really, really good book. Anyway. Other questions? All right. You're not good at conjecturing? Yeah. Ah. I just got two derivatives and described it. Well, <laughs> the, 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 the pattern for the dot products there, it's actually, there's actually an, a, a k-fold product rule for just ordinary functions. So how about I show you guys that? And if you see what I'm doing for this, it'll be simple to do that problem. You guys know that f times g prime is equal to f prime g plus f g prime, right? What's f g prime prime? Ever think about that? It's, yeah, it's derivative f prime prime g plus f prime g prime plus f prime g prime plus f g prime prime, which of course we can rewrite as f prime prime g plus f prime g prime times 2 plus f g prime prime. How about 3? f prime 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 g <laughs> plus, and you know what? Let me just go ahead and collect what's going to happen. What's going to happen? You're going to have 3 of the terms with f prime prime g, because you get 1 from here, and you get 2 from here. So you get 3 f prime prime g prime. And if you look at it, you're also going to get 3 terms that have f prime g prime prime, because you get 2 from here, and you get 1 from there by the product rule. And then, of course, we have the residual f g prime prime prime. Ah, you see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> if you think about it, you see what's going to happen next time. Four primes. It's going to go f, one, two, three, four, g plus four, f prime, 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 g prime plus, I'm getting tired of writing this. I'll suffer this one, but this last one I'm writing. F prime prime, g prime prime, plus 4, f prime, g prime prime prime, plus uh, f, g, quadruple prime. By the way, um, these are the so-called binomial coefficients. So like, um, see if I can remember the notation for it right. Um, I believe this would be like 4 choose 2, is it? I think this is 4 choose 2. This is 4 choose 1. This is 4 choose 0. This is 4 choose 3. I mean, it depends on what, how you want to look at it. This is symmetric, right? So you could kind of draw this picture either way. 4 choose. I think I did 4 choose 4. There's only one way to choose 4 things. There's only one way to choose 0 things from 4 things. There's only, but there's actually, there's, two, there's 6 ways to choose 2 things from 4 things. This is combinatorics. Now, so basically you have a plus b to the, um, to the n power. It's equal to a sum, k equals 0 to n, of n choose k a to the how do I go? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, n minus k, and then b to the k. That's the binomial theorem. And so essentially, you're seeing the same pattern for derivatives. So for derivatives, f g 
the nth derivative of that is a sum k equals 0 to, to n, n choose k. The n minus k derivative of x times the um, k derivative of g. And there's the, um, the unfold product rule for functions. Now, your problem is about dot products. But is it different? Not really. I mean, I would have been impressed if you gave me this answer without me saying this. It's not something I'm expecting of everybody. Because not everyone's been shown the binomial theorem in a way that's rememberable, right? Like, I mean, a lot of people will show you this, right? But we don't always get enough time to get back to this level of detail. So I think I've said too much for that problem now. I'm sorry. I'll say less for the next question. Someone asked me a question I can't answer. Yes? For, for problem 30, remember that I have freed you from the insidious phrase, verify that A is equal to this. <laughs> A sub, yeah, the, the yeah, the formulas for A sub n and A sub t may be quite insidious, yes. My, one, of my, one of the things my brother has <coughs> that's kind of interesting is, you know, he, they use maple at Appalachian where he teaches, and uh, he has this one curve with a relatively simple formula for the parameterization of the curve, and he uses maple to calculate its curvature. Maple's like Mathematica, right? And the uh, formula for the curvature is something like 10 pages or something. It's not hard to write relatively simple parameterized curves, which just spit out these awful, awful formulas for curvature. Much worse torsion. So yeah, don't, I wouldn't expect a super awesome, nice, simple formula there for problem 30. No, no. I see Mr. Vu is not here today, but the, the, the solution he was suggesting in the back row, basically what he was saying for that problem we worked on the end of last class was, I don't think he's here, um, basically just you can set up modified spherical coordinates on the plane, and if you do that, the equation for the circle just becomes that that spherical radius is whatever the radius of the circle was. So. Um, Let's see here. So for something like, I don't know, let's try something similar. Let's suppose that this plane is x plus um, 2y minus z equals 2 to 1. And suppose I want to find a circle here, the parameterization for a circle like that. And let's, let's make the point as simple as we can, but not too simple. Um, If I do 1, and if I do uh, no fractions, I will not allow fractions. Uh, two, zero, Sorry. <laughs> Anything but fractions. What's that? 2, 0, 1? Yeah. Is that right, guys? Two, zero, zero. Two, yeah, zeros are good. Do 2, 0, 1, will that work for us? Yeah. 2 plus, yeah, OK. So let, and let's suppose we want the circle of radius 3. We want to find the parameterization of that circle. I think what he was saying was to like set up spherical coordinates based on that point. So Yeah, I don't know how to do with I don't know how to do that. Like I don't know how to do what what he, what he's talking about, he's got some kind of geometric intuition for this phi and theta he's thinking about. I can't I'm I'm not inside his brain. I don't know what he's thinking. I'm just not geometric in that way. But what I, I can show you how to set up the spherical coordinates there would be something like, you know, um, so essentially, 
<clears throat> x minus x minus 2 is equal to rho cosine theta sine phi. Um, y is equal to rho um, sine theta sine phi, right? And z is equal to, um, well, sorry, z, z minus 1 is rho um, cosine phi. And so I, I can rewrite this. Basically, that's just x minus 2 is playing the role of x. But more to the point, let me rewrite these. x is equal to 2 plus rho. Oh, y is equal to rho sine phi, and z is equal to 1 plus. I think that's essentially spherical coordinates centered at the point. But I'm also writing them in terms of the ambient Cartesian coordinates. So this relates, this relates the, the non-standard spherical coordinates based on that point to the Cartesian coordinates. No, no. My sphericals in the notes are cosine, sine, 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 cosine, like that. I mean, there are probably about a half a dozen other popular conventions for quote unquote spherical coordinates, but that's the one I usually use in here. Now, um, so, I mean, geometrically, what, what the. Um, Let's see here. So if this is, let me draw the point and draw the plane like dead on. So the, um, the um, how to say this, the, um, if I take this point out here, the rho is this distance. Now, I, I don't have a clear picture of what the plane looks like. Um, Okay, but uh, here's the thing: is it, with this, with his notation, right? I can, I can then say, okay, well, I'm looking for a circle, right? It, this much is the, the the nice thing about this is the imposition of the circle in these in this coordinates is really simple. The circle is what it's rho. The circle. Uh, I mean, this circle is the intersection of the sphere, rho equals to three, with the non-standard coordinates, right? And, and that plane. So the, the sphere, which gives me the circle I'm interested in, that's easy. I can just set rho equal to 3, right? And that gives me a little bit of a simplification because that gives me something like x is equal to 2 plus 3 cosine theta sine phi, right? y is equal to 3 sine theta sine phi. And z is equal to 1 plus 3 cosine phi. Now that. This does not yet put me on the circle, right? All that does is it fixes me to the sphere of radius 3 about the point. How do I actually get to the circle that we're interested in? I have to impose the plane equation, right? But it's fairly obvious what to do. In order to do that, what can you do? You just you take these equations and you feed them to the plane. So what's that give me? That gives me, you know, 2 plus 3 cosine theta sine phi plus 2 times 3 sine theta sine phi minus 1 minus 3 cosine phi all equals to what? All equals to 1, right? And we're almost done. Because I can, I can use that equation, right, to um, write theta in terms of phi somehow, I think. Can I do that? I don't know. Maybe I can't. Maybe his way isn't much better than what I was doing the other day. I mean, if I could see geometrically what he's trying to see, that probably circumvents what I'm doing right now. Well, um, 
I, I don't know. Sine, I'm sorry. Sine phi, um, three cosine theta, right? Plus six what? Sine theta. That's my sine phi terms. I've got a plus two here, a minus one here. That gives me what? Oh, that cancels. Oh, the, the constants cancel out. That's kind of nice. So that equals three cosine phi. Am I right about that? Do you guys agree with my algebra? Before I get too excited about this? That's actually pretty sweet because that means that, sorry, I, I learned that word from, uh, I went to Applebee's the other day and my server was saying that everything was sweet and I was just like, this word's sweet, it's, it's, it's a great expression, I should use it. Let's see here. I think this example is probably more sick, but um, <laughs> that's actually cotangent of phi. Now I can solve for phi. Why do I care about that? See, that's the key to the kingdom right there. Once I have that, then that means I can state theta in terms of phi, which means I can go take this and I can go plug it in here, here, and here. That gives me the functions of phi in terms of theta, and I leave theta alone, theta is my parameter. So this shows you how to parameterize the curves in term, ter curve in terms of theta. It's still not as pretty as I would like. I think what I'm gonna find with the method I outlined last class when I write up the solution, I think you're gonna like it more. I think I've now spent about a half hour class time on this. But this is a hard problem. And if I just showed you the slick solution at the start of it, you wouldn't really appreciate the struggle, would you? But his idea to use spherical coordinates here to try to do it is really outside the box. I'm very, very happy about this idea. What's in the box? Do you guys do you guys know what I'm referring to? That is not what I'm referring to. <laughs> no, it's not that. Don't look at this. I realize now that my my search cannot be done. Well, I don't know. Not Liberty Way allows for R rating, so I mean, I can't really go wrong with YouTube. What's in the box? Come on, where'd you go? Like currently, this is in a lot of movies. to get through the toilet paper commercial. All right, there we go. Oh, come on. Oh, don't you do that to me. Go away. Is it? Did it? Did it? Oh man, come on. Okay, he's chrome.
take it and take a couple and pass it on. Ah! Really? Oh, okay, okay. While we're at it. I'll let the donuts pass around one. Watch them. Show of hands, who's never seen this? You guys. I thought you guys were cultured. Yeah, I, I will. You guys are eating donuts. I'll 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 stop it here. Oh 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 oh. So I, I think it's on Netflix. I'm not sure. This is uh, this is Weird Al's um, movie from 1988. It's called UHF. It uh, it parodies most of your major 1980s action films. It's very good. When everybody somebody says what's in the box, I always think of this though. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, anyway. Yeah, I think this film is not that known, but it's unfortunate because it's I think it's still funny. I don't know. But Okay, other questions? Yes. Oh well, I didn't. I didn't pin you down there, so you you could you could parameterize this tangent line. Uh, you could use you could do either t or you could do t minus one. Either would be right. Yeah. But how do you know that either one is right? How do you? What's that? What are, like, what are you getting that from? Like, how do you know that either one is right? Like, are there situations where one would be right and one wouldn't be right? Well, so you know, how do you? I mean, how do you parameterize a curve? I mean, for example, um, let's see here. How about two 
cosine t, 2 sine t, um, 3t. What is this thing? What, what is this thing? I mean, what is this curve? It's an upward spiral, right? This, this is a helix. It's a helix with radius 2 and the, the slope in the z direction is 3. But the thing is, I could just as well, right? Like that. It's still a helix. So, like, what's the right parameterization for a curve? I mean, if you take a particular curve, there are infinitely many ways to parameterize that curve. So which is the correct one? I don't know. I mean, I told you to parameterize the tangent line. I didn't tell you which parameterization of the tangent line to give me. So there's a myriad of answers. Now, the lazy answers that I expect and don't object to um, are simply the ones where you know, you do L of t is equal to, what's the, let's see here, that one. I'm asking you for the tangent line at the point 1 cosine 1 cosine 1 cosine 1 sine 1, right? So I think we're looking at t equals to plus or minus 1, I suppose, but, well, it's ambiguous, right? I mean, that's the thing. This, this tangent line, th this, this, this curve actually, it's, it's covered more than once. If you look at it, if the, if the domain is all reals, the positive reals cover the same point set as the negative reals when you feed it into it because like t of uh, r of minus 1 and r of 1 map to the same point. So uh, anyway, without loss, without, without, you know, without loss of, um, no, there's no ambiguity for me just saying r of 1. Sir, I could put minus 1 here too. Um, and um, oh, well, there's, there's a little bit of a catch there. And then t, r prime of 1, that, that's the parameterization of the tangent line. There is actually a difference between the parameter 1 and the parameter minus 1 for this curve. What's the difference? Oh, you know, I'm very unimaginative. This is also a helix. See, it's got, it's a helix which goes along the x-axis. So what this thing does is something like, I mean, roughly speaking, it's, it, it spirals out the x-axis. Now, maybe that's, that's time increasing, right? But what about, what about negative time? What if, about time decreasing? Same set of points, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think opposite direction, though, right? So the positive time, that's the thing, is it's spiraling away like this, right? But I think if you look at the negative time parameters, the difference would be it's the same set of points, but trans tra traversed in the opposite direction. So that's t less than 0. That doesn't matter much to us right now, but later when we talk about a line integral, the orientation of the curve also matters. The integral um, of a vector field along a curve in one direction versus the integral of the vector field along the same curve in the opposite direction, they'll be equal in magnitude but opposite in sign. So the question of orientation eventually matters to us, but not right now for this homework. I mean, either would be correct. Yeah. I just think word problems are more fun if they have ninjas. I agree. Yes. <laughs> I never liked word problems before I knew, had ninjas in them, yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, sure. Problem 24, let um, C be a constant vector, <laughs> calculate the integral of TC plus T squared X hat DT. Yeah, I think the, um, the, thing, the thing I'd like for you to know about is just like a little lemma. 
which essentially, I mean, here, let me, let me write the lemma in its simplest form. The integral of a constant times a function, dt, all right, constant vector. When you sort through the definition of everything, what it boils down to is simply this. That's the integral of the function dt times the constant vector. So constant vectors you can pull out of integrals just like you can pull constants out of integrals. So with that principle, this problem becomes almost trivial. That's my, yeah, that's my intention. Okay. Think of it that way. But if you're uncomfortable with that, you can write C is equal to ABC, get it out into one big gory vector, integrate each component separately, and then have an answer which you don't understand as much. Okay. But I would rather that you thought about it that way. Exactly, x hat is a constant vector with respect to time. That is indeed the moral to the story, yes. So um, maybe tomorrow I can work a selection of book problems. Do you guys have questions about the ones I've assigned from the book? We can start hacking through those too, we got time. Or if you have gen more general conceptual questions, you're welcome to ask them. Whatever floats your boat, I'll see you tomorrow. Yes, sir.